romantic idea, but this butterfly is pinned with a sledgehammer. And in many of the lower reaches of the pyramid, the ideas are not only wrong— thesis, the Jewish religion, antithesis, the Roman religion, synthesis, the Greek religion, but vacuous, thesis, air, antithesis, earth, synthesis, fire and water. From this it can be seen that despite Hegel's claim that his system is necessary, in the logical sense, it remains largely arbitrary. Its logic has none of the rigour of Spinoza's geometric system, for instance, and as we shall see, when it strays into more practical areas, such as history, it can generate some very nasty ideas indeed. The notion of a national leader as the embodiment of the world soul may have had some poetic justification in Napoleon's day, but is definitely not acceptable thinking in the light of twentieth-century experience. Despite the publication of this gross work, Hegel was still broke. The university remained closed, and he began looking for a job— but by now a dialectical process closer to home had produced its inevitable synthesis. Hegel's landlady had given birth to a son, named Ludwig. A short time later Hegel left Jena to take up the post of editor of the Bamburger Zeitung, a job he was to hold for the next two years. Alas, we can only imagine what his editorials were like, as all copies of this newspaper dating from 1807 to 1808 appear to have fallen foul of the spiritualizing process of history. At the age of thirty-eight, Hegel now became headmaster of a gymnasium in Nuremberg. This post he was to hold for the next eight years, and it gave him sufficient free time to continue with his philosophical work. By this time Hegel had long since abandoned the thesis of revolutionary liberation, and had embraced its antithesis with a vengeance. He was perfect for the post of headmaster, declaring— the ideal of all education is to root up those individual imaginations, thoughts, and reflections which youth may have and form. Thought, as much as will, must commence with obedience. Like many schoolmasters who are uninterested in their job or just playing lazy, he was a martinet. One disturbed Herr Rector Hegel in his study at his peril. One of his pupils relates— I and another were sent along to lay the pupil's grievances before him. But what a reception we got! I scarcely knew how we got down the stairs. Then another amazing antithesis took place. Hegel fell in love. This concept may be as difficult for some to grasp as Hegel's dialectical notion of the absolute. By now Hegel was forty years old and a confirmed bachelor, apart from one unfortunate lapse. Years of unremitting study had taken their toll. His sullen, pasty face was prematurely aged, he had lank, receding hair, and the portraits catch a distinct shiftiness in his eyes. He was thick-set, but stooped, with a rather embarrassed, awkward social manner. Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel appears to have had no charisma, even in the eyes of his most ardent disciples. The girl he fell in love with, Marie von Tucher, came from a respectable old Nuremberg family, and was just eighteen years old. Marie was a friend of Jean-Paul, the popular early romantic novelist, and believed in such romantic notions as feeling and impulsive gestures. Hegel wrote her lumbering poems in which he painstakingly analysed the dialectical nature of love. Even when they met on their trysts, Hegel remained very much the headmaster, often adopting a censorious tone with regard to Marie's flighty romantic notions. Afterward, in his letters, he would attempt to apologise— I confess that when I have to condemn principles, I too early lose sight of the way and manner in which they are present in a particular individual, in this case in you, and that I am apt to take them too earnestly, because I see in them their universal bearing and consequence, which you do not think of, which indeed for you are not in them at all. One wonders what he would have said if she'd planted a tree of liberty in the marketplace, as Hegel had done at her age. But the fact is, Marie seems to have returned the love of her fuddy-duddy old sourpuss. In 1811 they were married, a joyous social event which was slightly marred by the unexpected appearance of Hegel's Jena landlady, who created a scene. Indignantly she brandished a piece of paper which she claimed was Hegel's written promise to marry her. According to one report she was appeased and indemnified. But another old flame was not so easily extinguished— when Hegel's sister Christiane heard of his marriage, she had a nervous breakdown, described in the unfeeling chauvinist parlance of the time as 
hypochondriacal melancholy without bursts of hysteria. Christiane had been working as a governess, and had not been able to bring herself to marry. Her rejection of one suitor had resulted in an outbreak of nervousness, accompanied by bizarre behaviour. Hegel offered to take her in, but Christiane's violent jealousy of Hegel's wife made this offer unthinkable to her. Instead, she went to stay with a relative, where, to begin with, she spent all day on the sofa howling and screaming. According to the relative, she expressed deep dissatisfaction with her brother and deep hatred of his wife. Her condition deteriorated to the point where she was confined in an asylum, but she was released after a year. Hegel maintained his customary imperturbability, but this evidence of mental instability in his sister must surely have caused him alarm. He continued to suffer from bouts of deep depression, and at one stage he described a descent into dark regions where nothing shows itself to be firm, determinate, and secure, where splendours flash everywhere but next to abysses. He told how he first became aware of his philosophy, and suggested that every human being who has such a turning point experiences the nocturnal point of the contraction of his nature through whose narrows he is pressed, fortified and assured to feel secure with himself, and secure in the usual daily life, and if he has already rendered himself incapable of being satisfied with that, secure in an inner noble existence. Psychiatrists have frequently pointed to the yearning for protection or safety that animates so much even abstract thinking. Hegel's philosophy, which came from a profound impulse, may well have reflected a deep internal division in his psyche. Such speculation would be open to ridicule were it not for the uncannily schizoid and subsequent healing nature of his dialectical process, which he saw as the way mind works. Despite all these difficulties, Hegel's marriage was by all accounts a happy one. Marie produced two sons, Karl and Emmanuel. As they grew up, they were joined by their third brother, Ludwig, who came to live with the family after the death of his mother in Jena. Despite Hegel's best intentions, this didn't work out. Ludwig was consumed with resentment. He appears to have inherited more than a little of his father's intellect. Following in his father's footsteps, he became a student radical. He wanted to study a medicine, but Hegel insisted that he take up commerce. Ludwig ran away and joined the Dutch Foreign Legion. He was then shipped to the East Indies, where he caught fever and died. It was during this period that Hegel wrote his second great work, The Science of Logic. This magniloquum opus is distinguished by being almost entirely devoid of the two subjects mentioned in its title. By science, Hegel meant metaphysics, the very antithesis of physics, and by logic he meant his dialectical method. If you accept Hegel's dialectical method as logical, his system is indeed the most rigidly structured, comprehensive, and brilliantly argued system ever conceived. If you don't accept this, there is a strong temptation to view the whole thing as a metaphysical aberration. According to such a view, Hegel should have called this work the metaphysics of metaphysics, which would indeed have better indicated its contents. In The Science of Logic, Hegel doesn't consider logic, but instead considers the concepts we use when arguing logically, such as Kant's categories, being, quantity, relation, and so forth. Of these, the most important for Hegel is relation, and the most universal relation is contradiction. Thus begins the dialectical process of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. As we have already seen, Hegel considered thought as the ultimate reality, and as the dialectical method governed the process of thought, so it also governed reality. This, for Hegel, was the science of his logic. Everything was subject to the dialectical method. The science of logic reveals the fundamental difference between Kant and Hegel. Kant was fully qualified to write a book on science and logic, being an original scientist and a brilliant logician. Hegel, on the other hand, took the historical approach to philosophy. It's not just his sentences that take the long-term view on the outcome of events. Hegel saw the world comprehensively as an ever-evolving historical process. Such a view blurs the particularity of the here and now. Everything stands in the shadows of historical perspective. By comparison, Kant viewed the world with the clarity of a scientist. 
Kant's view is the one in fashion at present, but with human history approaching the end of a long expansionist era, it's possible that Hegel's view may yet re-emerge. The science of logic made Hegel famous. After only its first part was published, the universities of Heidelberg and Berlin offered him professorships. He chose Heidelberg, where he arrived in 1816. Hegel is the most prestigious philosopher to have held a post at this university. Hegel's landlady had given birth to a son, named Ludwig. A short time later, Hegel left Jena to take up the post of editor of the Bamburger Zeitung, a job he was to hold for the next two years. Alas, we can only imagine what his editorials were like, as all copies of this newspaper, dating from 1807 to 1808, appear to have fallen foul of the spiritualizing be seen that despite Hegel's claim that his system is necessary, in the logical sense, it remains largely arbitrary. Its logic has none of the rigor of Spinoza's geometric system, for instance, and as we shall see, when it strays into more practical areas, such as history, it can generate some very nasty ideas indeed. The notion of a national leader as the embodiment of the world soul is an idea, but this butterfly is pinned with a sledgehammer. And in many of the lower reaches of the pyramid, the ideas are not only wrong, thesis the Jewish religion, antithesis the Roman religion, synthesis the Greek religion, but vacuous, thesis air, antithesis earth, synthesis fire and water. From this it may have had some poetic justification in Napoleon's day, but is definitely not acceptable thinking in the light of twentieth-century experience. Despite the publication of this gross work, Hegel was still broke. The university remained closed, and he began looking for a job. But by now a dialectical process closer to home had produced its inevitable synthesis in process of history. At the age of thirty-eight, Hegel now became headmaster of a gymnasium in Nuremberg. This post he was to hold for the next eight years, and it gave him sufficient free time to continue with his philosophical work. By this time Hegel had long since abandoned the thesis of revolutionary liberation, and had embraced its antithesis with a vengeance. <laughs>